Today, we are thrilled to have Jennifer Mador. She's the Director of Rural Primary Care for the Nurse Practitioner Association of Alberta to help us learn more about the role of nurse practitioners and how they can play um, a role in the primary health care continuum. So with that said, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Well, nice to be here again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, RPAP, for inviting me back to present again. It's my pleasure to come to you as a representative of the Nurse Practitioner Association and a representative of the NP community to um, educate everybody a bit more about our role and where we think that we can be integrated into the system to uh, help solve some of the healthcare um, issues that are, are serving us right now. The Nurse Practitioner Association has been working with stakeholders for many, many years. Um, we um, specifically have worked with the RMA, who was um, lovely in putting forward a resolution for us recently to government to help promote um, a policy or promote the um, integration of nurse practitioners um, by way of a direct reimbursement model. So there's been a free, few resolutions over the last year that have come forward uh, from different communities. So wanted to acknowledge that uh, we've been doing this for a while and we're hoping to um, implement uh, direct reimbursement for nurse practitioners so that we can address the inequities and um, lack of access across Alberta, especially in rural locations. Um, so currently the biggest barrier for us, um, I would say, is um, funding mechanisms to implement nurse practitioners into all areas that we see, think that we could be integrated. Um, certainly there's still a component of education for people to acknowledge the role and understand the role. Um, but once people know about us, they they tend to want more of us and the limitation is a is reimbursement. So um, we've put forward a, a proposal to government and hopefully that all we'll, we can continue those conversations and grow our stakeholdership so that uh, we have the support that we need to be fully integrated. So some rural health statements that have come forward in the past policy statements, the government of Alberta should work to implement recommendations founded in the Rural Health Services Review Final Report, which was put out, I believe, in 2015, uh, 2017. So these recommendations have been around for a while. Uh, a few of those guiding principles are equitable access. So nurse practitioners would help improve that. Um, we know that a healthy rural Alberta is a healthy Alberta. Most of our our working groups are in, in rural Alberta and um, we need a healthy, prosperous um, rural Alberta in order for us to be productive. So um, we need to prioritize rural Alberta and, and keep our hospitals open and our access available um, to keep these communities healthy. Um, we understand that every rural community is unique, so it's not a one size fits all solution. I think it's important that we work with communities um, to understand what would be the best model that, for healthcare that would work for them um, and where, what resources are needed. And I think when we're in such an Im important time where we have all healthcare workforce um, de deficiencies, not just physicians and not just nurses, um, all of us are affected by this healthcare workforce issue. Um, we need to understand who's the, the best person for the, the jobs that are needed in each community. So I think what, Alberta and all of Canada and actually around the world is facing is a distributive issue. We, we need to see how we can maximize the scopes of practice of all healthcare providers and figure out how to best do that together. Um, we need to engage with our First Nation and Métis communities. Um, we need to acknowledge that there's historical travel and trading patterns that affect our ability to access healthcare and have resources for healthcare. Um, and this is all very unique to the rural context. I think that we need to, and we think that rural Albertans know their own needs. And so we need to speak to uh, communities in order to address what they feel is the most appropriate um, solution for, for what's going in that community. Um, generalist approach, when a provider comes into a community, I've been in rural communities as when I first started as an NP, um, you, you're kind of wearing all the hats. Um, so <laughs> you need to be able to find providers who, who can do primary care, urgent care, community care, public health, uh, home visits. Um, and so when we say generalist, we mean that you kind of know a lot about a little about a lot. Um, and if some are gifted to know a lot about a lot, that's a great provider, but it's it you would need to find some very ex experienced providers for that. And I think that's the challenge in rural Alberta is finding the providers who can wear all the hats. Um, and that's where the team concept is going to be really important for our solutions in healthcare. Um, 
we, I talked a little bit about this efficient resource maximization. So maximizing what we do have and the scopes of practice that we do have and uh, the infrastructure that we have. So being a little bit more efficient with what we got, because it's going to take a while to build more capacity, whether it's training more providers, recruiting more providers. So finding unique and um, invent innovative ways for us to work with what we have, I think is going to be our short term solution for our healthcare crisis. Um, so primary healthcare is a foundation of our, um, of our healthcare system. Uh, in case anyone isn't sure what primary healthcare is, it's typically the first place people would go for healthcare or wellness advice or programs. But unfortunately, that access has been limited. Um, and, and people are, are not able to access um, primary services the way that uh, we have in the past. So uh, often individuals are seeking care at tertiary centers, uh, emergency departments, um, or going to walk-in clinics where, where there's a lack of continuity of care. You see a different provider each time. So it's hard to maintain relationships. And so um, it's important that we invest in these primary um, early entry into the, into the system services. Um, and so when we think about primary care providers, really family doctors, physicians, um, and nurse practitioners are the only two uh, licensed regulated providers that have full scope of practice. We do have other providers who are providing care, extended class registered nurses. We have pharmacists who have um, some extended prescribing rights now that are also filling in this gap. Um, and so we need to acknowledge that it, there is a team dynamic and all, all of our providers are, are attempting to fill a deficit that exists. So um, we need to figure out how to do that all together and in a way that makes sense uh, financially and, and scope of practice wise. So currently uh, primary care um, could be also, sorry, I forgot about midwives. Our midwives are fantastic um, at providing prenatal care and obstetrical care to our patients. Um, and so um, there are, is a lot of lack of access for, um, for midwifery services and access to OBGYN. So um, we need to figure out how to, how to improve that access to care. Nurse practitioners can be part of that solution as well, um, but maximizing those, all scopes of practice to improve access to our patients is, is what's key. The one provider system of having focusing on just physicians is not going to meet the demand. And that's, they can't do it themselves. They're trying, <laughs> they're burning out, uh, they're retiring at a high rate, and um, they can't do it alone. Um, and it's, it's not their fault. It's just a, a system that is set up this way. And so I think in order for us to to fill this deficit of healthcare access issues, um, we need to think to other providers like nurse practitioners to assist in, in filling that gap and improving access, which is really the, the key point here is uh, access to care is a healthy Alberta um, and it'll decrease costs for the overall system if we can um, invest in primary care services. Um, I talked about this again, aging workforce, um, our physicians are burning out, we can't keep them in rural Alberta. They're wearing so many hats. Um, they're working so hard and uh, many of them not getting vacation. And so um, the integration of nurse practitioners can help offset some of that load, um, co doing locum coverage, assisting with covering in the emergency departments um, or urgent care centers um, and sharing that, that scope of practice and, and workload so that um, it's more of a team dynamic serving everybody um, is where ultimately we want to go. We're seeing that less physicians are going into family medicine, um, into specialized services. So we need to figure out how we can fill this, this gap that seems to be growing um, and these unfilled seats at, in residency um, spots, for example, um, is just indicative of how um, we need to invest in primary care to incentivize people to go into primary care. Um, and that goes for, for all professions. Again, it's a distributive issue. Lots of nurse practitioners, um, there's 850 of us in Alberta and 95% of us are trained in primary care, but we end up in um, other environments like acute care services because that's where the jobs are. So there needs to be an investment in primary care in order to make it attractive uh, for, all, for all providers really. So a little bit of a projection uh, for percentage of change in the supply of what's coming down the pipe. Um, NPs are projected to grow quite substantially across Canada um, as many of our colleges have increased capacity. So um, out of and 
physiotherapists, OTs, RNs, and physicians were, were growing at a quite high rate. Um, so that's projected to continue to increase over the next 10 years. Um, and so what we would like to see um, with our proposal to Alberta Health is that um, nurse practitioners become integrated into the part of what is covered um, by Alberta Health Alberta Healthcare plans so that patients don't have to pay for primary services by an NP. And that's happening as well. Um, currently, as, as NPs try to fill a gap with their services, they, they have to charge privately currently um, in order to provide what they've been trained to do because uh, there's not an integrative um, reimbursement model. So um, that's what we're hoping to, to change so that we can join clinics, open clinics, um, and, and be more integrated into the, the overall solution. The role of the nurse practitioner is not to take away um, the financial sustainability of another provider. We need to, there's enough work to go around. We have a mil, over a million patients without access to primary care. Our acute care services and um, budget is ballooning. Um, and so there's more than enough work to go around. And I think that we can find a way for all of us to work together. Um, I have a great collaborative relationship with the physicians I work with. Um, it can really help to offset the workload that physicians have, uh, if you can carve out um, a, a good relationship working together. I think there's different models out there and how people have decided um, to work that out, whether it be fee for service or ARP funding um, and how they reimburse the nurse practitioner is always hard to know how to do. Um, and it creates some different ways of, of practicing. And so, um, and it can create some conflict. Um, so I think we need to sort that out. And if we were to have direct reimbursement to nurse practitioners, I think it would be part of a solution where an NP could come in with their direct funding and help offset the workload or the burden that um, is burning out some of our physician colleagues. If, if a physician works in a community and you know their, their panel is full, uh, they don't have any more capacity and they're overworked, the nurse practitioner could be an, a partner in that and bring their uh, direct funding to help support overhead, help support after hours. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. Uh, there's also the consults that could occur as something gets more complex. Um, nurse practitioners have a wide scope of practice, but um, we're not physicians. Uh, we do we can do a lot of similar things, but at some point, as with family physician, there's there's a time where you have to consult uh, someone with uh, more knowledge. And whether that's a specialist or your physician who's in family practice, there's um, an opportunity there for consultation billing. So and um, a relationship that way. So I think I think this can be fleshed out um, and we just need to, to work on that relationship. Those who have integrated NPs, um, typically I've heard they, they really enjoy Physicians really enjoy working with the, the nurse practitioner who can spend ex, a little bit extra time. Suggest I would suggest um, complex disease um, management, such as diabetes, hypertension, um, screening uh, for cancer, women's health. There's, there's these niche areas where there can really be a collaborative relationship occurring. So I think, I think we could work that out, but I can also see um, the turf that physicians want to that they want to protect and they see it as a uh, competition. So um, I, I think it depends on the community and it depends on the relationship that you can work out uh, it would, and always in the best interest of the community, right? Are nurse practitioners paid by Alberta Health Services? Uh, yeah, so um, there are different uh, funding models for nurse practitioners currently. There's the acute care Alberta Health Services, which is the hospitals. Uh, there's the PCN, which is the primary care networks. And uh, then there's uh, private uh, pay where nurse practitioners have opened their own businesses and charge privately for their services. Um, so AHS being in the hospitals is different and from Alberta Health, which is the government side. And right now we don't have a direct Alberta Health funding model, uh, which is similar to what physicians have with a ARP, which is alternate relationship funding, or fee-for-service. We don't have access to those kinds of reimbursement models. Right. And um, can nurse practitioners bill for services? No. Many of us in our rural community really, really want to have the nurse practitioner being the primary care worker. We we really we know the value of them, but our some of our rural docs 
are reluctant unless you can go on call in the emergency on rotation with them. Currently, that's in development. So Alberta Health Services nurse practitioners are currently undergoing a unionization process. So their funding will be different. So they have to abide by the Alberta Health Services medical bylaws um, and governance structure, which is currently being reviewed. Um, I do work in an emergency department as a most responsible provider. Uh, so we call that MRP. Uh, for short. And as an MRP, in my scope of practice, based on my training, I am able to independently see patients in the emergency department and discharge them uh, up to a certain acuity level. So currently I see CTAS, the triage score the, of lower acuity. So threes, fours, and fives. Um, they're very similar to what would come in and out of a primary care office, except for the threes. Uh, they can often have more complexity, needing admission or consultation with specialists. I do see them independently up to a certain um, comfort level. And I have fabulous physicians that I work with and consult with as necessary. Um, and sometimes that consultant is over rapid. Uh, if it's a uh, inflamed gallbladder, for example, uh, my consult with a physician is going to be that general surgeon. So it depends on the NP. Uh, not You can't plug any NP in any rural community and ask them to work in emergency. Uh, just like physicians need a two plus one year, uh, with the plus one is the emergency um, residency or a five-year residency. You know, you have to have the right the right person and the right training. Um, and so that would need to be worked out with AHS and that would be a different contract. Um, in rural remote communities, when I've worked contract work, um, yes, I have uh, done on call overnight. Um, and uh, if I needed any assistance, medevacking or calling the next community over to the for a physician consult, I've done that as well. Um, so it really depends on the resources and the needs of your community. Um, and yes, I'll just say yes, that could be potentially worked out um, with as long as there would be a safety net and backup for those higher acuity patients that would be presenting. Okay, so that, that was a good answer because um, our, our particular site has a lot of CTAS ones and twos. And so that's um, just, that would all have to be taken to, into whether there's a backup physician that could be called for that. Yeah, or if the NP is trained enough, there's um, a few NPs who work rural remote and they're it for the community. And if it's, if they're in, needing to intubate, they're trained to do it. Um, if they work STARS, they're trained to do it. We have NPs seeing high acuity, um, at the Airdrie Urgent Care independently. So they're, they're out there. Um, we just um, need to formalize that process a little bit and make sure that people have the appropriate training. Okay, that's great. Uh, we have another issue right now where um, one medical clinic has taken on a number of physician assistants and are letting them be equivalencies to them, even though they're the most responsible physician. And so it's blurring everything uh, we didn't, we weren't proactive when we had the opportunity one to two years and back to really promote the nurse practitioner, which would have been a great advantage. And now we have this blurring of roles happening in our community. So there's always something, isn't there? There's a lot of overlap and it can make it very confusing. Uh, and I think it's easy when you can say black and white, this is your scope, this is what you do. But even with physician's assistants, they're, they're an extender of the physician. The physician is supposed to sign off their work. Um, depends on the relationship and the experience of the PA, but we've had PAs working in rural remote communities who have extended scope doing very high acuity things for a long time. So I can't speak specifically to their role, but typically they're an extension of the physician and the phys physician is still the most responsible provider. Whereas the NP could be MRP, depending on, on their training and the contract that they're under. A um, couple more questions. I'll try and do them in order, Jennifer. So one in the chat box, are doctors clinics paying for the NPs? Uh, I believe that that is occurring, yeah. And M Myrna, you had your hand up? Yeah, um, I would just like to, I guess, make a comment or hope that this will direct into some dialogue, perhaps. Um, I think that some of the local, so we have a nurse practitioner in our area, and um, and I'm not going to say that this area is one of them, but some communities that have nurse practitioners in them, um, some of the doctors feel threatened or or not acceptance to the nurse practitioners. And I believe it's more of the old way of thinking that some of them go by numbers and they want to have their number based because they're paid and they want to have X amount of weeks booked in advance. 
And I think that's the old way of thinking, or perhaps it's their dollar amounts thinking versus the quality of care for the patient and the better outcome is seeing getting them in front of uh, healthcare, whether it's a nurse practitioner or a, or a physician, is getting them in front of somebody and getting their needs addressed immediately so that um, so that they don't deteriorate in health quality. And I think that it, how do we educate the doctors that are in those communities that are not maybe um, welcoming as much or causing some disturbance? How do we educate them to say, this nurse practitioner is, the community knows they want them, but how do we train that doctor to say that this is not a threat to you, this is just uh, another way of accessing healthcare for our communities where we're are already having um, a high demand of shortages in our communities? Yeah. Um, well, my door is always open. I'm happy to, to have a conversation with any of our doctors who are willing to learn and understand the role, the education and the relationship that can be built. Um, I don't uh, blame uh, a physician for feeling that there's competition coming over because that's, that is what it is. They have to, they have to run a business and fee for service model models incentivize um, certain ways of practicing. And it, and they have to hold a certain panel to make an income to keep a roof over the head of the clinic. Um, so it is it is um, uh, a disturbance that in the force <laughs> of healthcare. Um, but hopefully, as you pointed out, um, our, the intention is for improved access and improved patient care. So I think that that just has to be worked out in individual communities um, because the purpose is to have everybody functioning to their optimal scope everybody um, providing quality care to patients um, and everyone um, having access to so that we decrease costs to the system, which are much higher when we start transporting people to acute care services. So I think I, there's a big conversation to be held. Uh, I don't know if everyone heard about the MAPS initiative. That's the Modernizing Alberta Primary Care Strategy. Lots of higher level talks going on of how we're going to to restructure healthcare so that all players can be equally at the table working together for the health of Albertans. And I think um, we just need to continue to educate and see how we could do this together uh, rather than competing against each other because we miss the goal, which is healthcare and helping people. So um, if there's any physicians who want to reach out and have a conversation about how we can do this together, my door is open to that. And another one is when the advanced practice uh, nurse practitioners are working in remote areas, like you mentioned, they are it. Does that mean there are no RNs to carry out treatments? Uh, occasionally not. Uh, I've been lucky. I've usually had one with me. What can we do to advocate for nurse practitioners in our communities? I think the communities need to be vocal about um, the needs that they have, um, the lack of access that they have. If they're seeing you know, ongoing closures of eMERGE departments, traveling large distances for care, having patients with poor outcomes um, in their community that could be a, could have been addressed earlier um, due to lack of access. I think that those are good indicators to say, you know, we need we need more providers, whether it's a physician, a nurse practitioner, an extended class nurse, a social worker, uh, extended class paramedics that are running primary care centers. I think we need to find um, the providers, because we have a huge workforce issue, um, we need to find who's going to make the most sense in that community um, to offset costs and and be the most effective provider. The next question, uh, our PCN has been looking for nurse practitioners and just wondering what's the best way to advertise or find nurse practitioners who do want to go to rural PCNs. Yeah, PCN um, support program funding has been challenging. I think it depends on where your community is. I guess, why don't I go, I'll get to it in my presentation a little bit as we talk about growing your own, um, but it's it's always easier um, and more sustainable to find the registered nurse who's integrated and deep rooted in a community who's willing to upgrade two years to become a nurse practitioner after they've practiced for at least five. So um, it's a bit of a faster track to get this extended uh, advanced practice scope of practice that you may need in a community. So uh, I think sometimes the recruitment is more difficult than finding someone in, who's already existing in your community. So that's something that I would recommend. There is 
some modification that's needed to the PCN support program funding and how that's structured and the integration of nurse practitioners into the governance structure of PCNs in general. And I think that as nurse practitioners are currently going through a unionization process within AHS, they're holding out to see how that negotiation goes um, from a funding perspective to see where the jobs are being incentivized for them to go. And so it's a bit of a, a hard time right now um, with recruitment um, when these negotiations are at play. Are there an abundance of nurse practitioners in the province? Is it hard to recruit for one? Um, so I'll go through my slides. That's a great segue. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> All right. So um, nurse practitioners, um, I just want to highlight our graduate prepared advanced practice providers. They have been registered nurses first. Most of the programs across Canada are going to be um, having a minimum of five years of registered nurse bedside experience before you can apply. So there's all of that um, clinical experience that's needed prior to becoming a nurse practitioner. Then the NP degree is at least two years. Some uh, NPs do a uh, master's, then a plus one, um, a post master's uh, certificate as a nurse practitioner. So some will be three or four years, um, but most of them across the board are two. Um, in general, there's primary care, family, all ages as the designation. There's also neonatal and um, adult critical care nurse practitioner designations, but most of the NPs that graduate are gonna be family, all ages and ready to work in primary care. Um, some nurse practitioners have also gone above and beyond and done their doctoral degrees. So they've done research to get their PhD. They've gone to the States to do their doctorate of nursing. Um, some have MBAs and some have done their midwifery degree. So lots of, of training for our nurse practitioners. Um, in Canada, we've got lots. Ontario leads the way with over 4,000 and they're the most ahead of anybody with their NP-led clinics. I think they have about 250 NP-led clinics. And next in line to them is, um, these numbers are from 2021, so they're a bit lower, but um, British Columbia has well integrated their nurse practitioners through their PCN programs because they've um, allowed that to open up to NP-led clinics, um, which is not something that we've done in Alberta. So um, we, can we can learn from our other provinces um, of how to make this work. Um, in the US, there's over 270,000 nurse practitioners down there. That's where NPs started. They started in um, rurally in, in Canada. Um, but in Alberta, this is also 2021 data. We have over 800 here. But most of us are employed in hospitals uh, rather than primary care because that's where the funding has gone to. So we have a distributive issue uh, that incentivizes where we're flowing. The roles, we have advanced knowledge and decision making. Uh, it is extended beyond the registered nurse. Uh, we have advanced skills in diagnostic reasoning that's in line or, and overlapping with our physician colleagues. Um, and so just to make it easy, some people like charts. Um, we can act as most responsible provider in primary care and up to a, a certain scope of practice in the eMERGE, not acute care inpatient. Uh, that is not something that's bit, that is occurring. Um, we can do health screening such as pap smears and prostate exams chronic conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure. Uh, we can act and interpret x-rays and act on those results, order blood work, prescribe medication inclusive of narcotics. Um, we can use uh, preventative therapies and substance use uh, therapies like Suboxone. We can do procedures like IUD insertions, stitches, casting, uh, biopsies. We refer to all specialists and we complete uh, specialty forms like driver's medicals and disabilities and WCB assessment. So lots of over, overlap, which can complement um, the, the needed um, access issues that exist right now. Uh, I already talked about primary care. Uh, I just wanna ask, I just wanna showcase what we're asking for uh, as far as direct reimbursement and the piece of the pie uh, that is that uh, that we're asking for. So currently there's no funding for nurse practitioners directly to open primary care clinics. And this is the Alberta health budget from 2022, 2023. Um, and so you can see um, where our money tends to go. Um, this is a little bit outdated as I made it last year. Uh, but since then, we've received some new federal transfer funds. So the provinces have to make an agreement with the, the federal government about how we're going to use these funds. Um, and we would suggest that in, um, 
investment in primary care is very much needed. And if we were to integrate nurse practitioners with direct uh, reimbursement funding, it would um, account for 0.4 of the overall budget uh, is what we're proposing. So not, not a huge uh, drop in the bucket. Um, funding costs. Um, so there's a lot of costs. There's, you also have to keep in mind that there's a lot more physicians. So that's why there's a lot more of the pie. Uh, same with pharmacists, but it does speak to how much of the budget goes to these areas. And so what we're proposing is, again, another a small piece of the pie uh, to improve patient access and decrease costs. So decreasing costs by um, having sustainable salary-based modeling that keeps people out of hospital and in primary care. And that's where the cost savings occur. Um, this has been a UCP election platform. It's been a part of MAPS. We've had the Auditor General recommend nurse practitioners and reforming uh, primary care services. Um, and then the MAPS initiative, if you go into that document, uh, one of the top recommendations is to reform primary care reimbursement and include nurse practitioners in that direct reimbursement. Um, we know that fee-for-service doesn't incentivize quality um, visits, five minute visits isn't isn't great for patients. So um, we would suggest that salary based modeling would be um, better for providers to prevent moral distress and burnout from just seeing people um, and band-aiding their issues as opposed to spending the time needed to um, minimize the number of times people have to come back as well and doing a, a comprehensive um, visit that nurse practitioners are very well trained to do. So I think we would um, agree that a salary-based model would, would be better. Um, our proposal to government um, is that we're proposing modernizations of the healthcare system. Uh, we're, we want to address the gaps in women's health, rural, remote, indigenous communities and special populations. We um, will deliver comprehensive primary care and that it would be sustainable. Um, there's a few unsustainable models out there that are trying to fill this gap and we wanna uh, work with government um, and all of our stakeholders to make sure that we have sustainable solutions with full integration of all of our primary care providers. Um, all right, this is the rural piece I wanted to talk about um, is grow your own. So Nova Scotia has done this, they got uh, grant funding uh, from the Ministry of Health out there, and they identified um, keen nurses in their communities who were already um, integrated to go back to school. Um, and there was an incentive program there to uh, for a return of service for a certain period of time. And um, we found they found that people were more likely to stay in these communities when they already grew up there and had deep roots there. Um, and so this is a, a recruitment strategy that is needed. But I think when we think about recruiting from other countries, we have to make sure that our salary based reimbursement is going to be competitive. Um, and currently Alberta's isn't. So um, we don't have NP led clinics. Our salary that we're offering is less than BC and Ontario um, or up north. It's less than the US. So if we want to recruit and retain, uh, we need to be compensating our providers um, that's reflective of their responsibilities and, and it's a competitive. So that's where uh, funding needs to, that needs to change. Um, I think that is, that's all. I think there's a lot of questions though. Yep. We can go there if you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think questions are great because we all learn from them. So anyway, the next one is, are there credentials for a nurse practitioner trained in the U S um, recognized in Canada, uh, USA, the recognized, I'm assuming recognized in Canada, are they the same equivalent? I think it depends on the province and the schooling and the state that the NP went to down in the US. But I would say in general, um, I think most of them would, would be accepted. Um, I did my US exam and it was accepted in BC but I did my training in BC. So there's a relationship that BC accepts it. Uh, it just depends on the, the college and the process and the, the communication between that NP state and what they, how they license themselves. Cause each state is different in the U S. Okay. Can NPs keep their RN license to offset living costs in case there's not enough employment in rural areas, uh, but are not willing to move? 
Um, you certainly can. Uh, it creates a medical legal issue um, and confusion, especially if you're working as an RN and an NP in the same community. If you talk to our college or uh, or legal team, uh, they'll suggest that you don't do that because if uh, you're working as an RN, but you have the knowledge to intervene at a higher scope of practice, you can be held liable. Um, so um, it's recommended to choose. Uh, we do see that um, there are NP trained NPs out there who have elected to go back to RN bedside work because they can make more money. So again, a funding issue uh, where current funding models are not reflective of the roles and responsibilities and our experienced RNs can make more money as an RN than doing their NP. So there's lack of incentive there and, and that needs to change too. Um, that's part of the union and part of the NPAA uh, negotiating with Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services to change that so that we incentivize uh, more NPs, want more RNs doing and upgrading uh, because there's a, a discrepancy on the reimbursement. Um, in the chat box, I'm attending from Saskatchewan. I'm currently enrolled in the U of S nurse practitioner program with the hope of practicing in rural Alberta in the future. Mm -hmm. Are there any current incentives for our pro in our province for NPs wishing to relocate to Alberta? Uh, I think we're working on it. I've spoke with RPAP about that, about incentivization and into our rural communities. I think a few rural communities have advertised for their own NPs too, um, using some municipal dollars to do that. So people are getting pretty creative outside of government funding to make this happen. So um, they're all to say there are some incentives, but they're not um, provincially, you know, they're not across the whole province. It depends on the community and who's advertising the position at this point. And so that's where we feel that a direct reimbursement to NPs through government uh, would then recognize um, rural incentivization. And, and so that's part of our ask as well. What about patient education around NPs so they understand that they don't need a physician and can receive comprehensive care from an NP? Yeah, I think that's that's going to be us uh, as the Nurse Practitioner Association to continue to advertise what an NP is, uh, word of mouth, uh, people who have experienced NP care to to promote it if if they've enjoyed it and to let us know if they if they have some suggestions. Um, but I I think um, everyone needs a primary care provider. Um, so whether that's a physician or an NP, we need to figure out ways for people to access either one and. Um, and that's going to improve healthcare for everybody. So um, it's not that they don't need a physician, they, they need a primary care provider. And that could be an extended scope RN as well, or, pharm or pharmacist who can be an interim measure for some of this prescribing, although they're not, they wouldn't be as comprehensive. But um, I think we need to together do some education about other providers where access is available. And a comment on that, a rural incentive for NP, similar to what rural physicians get in remote areas, would be welcome. We have been asking for that as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Cardiologist told me, your mother is in good hands with your NP and the mom is 93. That's a real positive, nice comment there. That's wonderful. Yeah. Hello, it's Joyce Wicks again. How, uh, Jennifer, just how, how do you think the timelines are going with your negotiations then in your unionized process? Uh, what can we be looking forward to for how how soon? Are we looking at six months, a year? How long do you think this will take? I wish I had an answer for you, Joyce. Um, the Nurse Practitioner Association has been advocating for direct reimbursement from government for at least the last seven years. Um, I've been doing this for the last year and a half, and the proposal that I was part of has been on, has been with them for two years. So we've been working hard. I think when there's a change in government and change in and cabinet and, and lots of changes within AHS, it does delay um, the process. And so um, the union is separate from us. The union is negotiating in hospital NPs, and we're hoping to negotiate community-based primary care NP services. And so um, the timeline when you're negotiating with government or negotiating with a big organization like AHS, uh, it's really hard to put a a timeline on it but if they're all actively occurring is all I, we continue to do it uh and the more voices we have behind us the the quicker i think that'll go okay well i'm from a community that's pretty politically active so if we have that moment with the health minister i'll put a good word in <laughs> oh that sounds great choice yeah thank you 
And please feel free to contact me directly if you would like to have a conversation about uh, your community needs and how we can maybe, you know, formulate a proposal together to to submit to government. We can maybe consider that, um, do a community assessment and and see where we can get an NP in there. What was that again what? about the max, max something or other? Oh, I, MAPS, I... Uh, M-A-P-S, the MAPS initiative. Okay. So that was a collaborative effort with key stakeholders and the government to have a forum of how we can transform primary health care and long-term care services. And so that was invested prior to the past election when um, Jason Copping was our health minister. So I was present uh, there voicing um, the nurse practitioner voice and there were other few other NPs there. Um, and so we're hoping that the recommendations from that forum uh, will be acted upon by the next government. Okay, that's good. I'll know to, be, to bring that up because we might have a meeting with the key people. We okay, might. great. And I'm sure we can include that MAPS link in the follow-up email from the session that all the attendees will get so that you'll have it as well. So it looks like we're good for questions. Jennifer, was there anything else you wanted to add before I go ahead and close the session? No, thank you for having me back. And again, I hope that uh, people will feel comfortable reaching out. And if they have um, any uh, people in their communities who have more questions, you have my email there in the chat. We can put together a town hall if, if there's a lot of interest from one community or um, or concerns from specific groups, then we can put that together too. It's probably more efficient um, doing a town hall or a larger forum like this when it's one community with a lot of people with questions. So we can set that up too. Sounds good. Okay, so I just want to thank everyone for your questions and being so engaged in this morning's session. It does really help all of us to learn a little bit more. And most certainly, um, thank you to you, Jennifer, um, for sharing and educating us more about nurse practitioners, their role and how they support rural health care.